And there we go. Good evening. Welcome back. This is the fifth of six lectures in this series on Central and South America. A couple of things to remind you of before we really get going. First, the um, Social Action Committee of the Unitarian Church is our main sponsor, but we cooperate with Ali, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, and they help us immensely to get the word out about this program. We are very grateful for that. Humanities Nebraska sponsors us in the sense of a grant um, to, uh, to help us each year, and they have been supporting us for about 35 years. So they've been heroic. They used to be Humanity, Nebraska Humanities Council, but now, um, and they supported us under that name as well. Please remember to silence your cell phones. Um, I probably don't need to remind people where the, uh, the restrooms are at this point, but down the hall you came in and off to the right. Um, extra parking across the Eldon Drive is permitted. Um, the hearing assistance is possible for, by checking in at the audio desk back here with Sherrod. And uh, snacks are being provided uh, by the, uh, the the people of the uh, the the um, social action committee. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, they are uh, provided by the people who who actually bring them, and so the donations you leave behind support future renditions of this the uh, winter lecture series. The rhythm is as always after. Um, we give our lecturer roughly an hour to speak to us. We take a break for about 15 minutes uh, where you can go into the other room, grab snacks, and then uh, we'll come back. Usually there's about 45 or 40 minutes left for Q&A, which does tend often to be a very interesting and exciting time. So I, if you haven't been back for Q&As uh, in this lecture series, uh, give it a try. I think you will possibly become a regular. Um, Brandon, who has been doing our recording for us and putting them, the recordings on the, uh, on the web, will show us a bit about uh, how to access that. And Sherrod is going to put on the screen some things that you can point to. That sounds good. All right. Really, Sherrod's going to show you, and I'll just kind of talk about it. But we record all of the, the lectures, and the lectures from this year and the previous years are available to see on our YouTube channel. If you search on Google for uh, Lincoln Unitarian Winter Lecture Series, you'll come up with a link to uh, the Winter Lecture Series page on the Unitarian Church of Lincoln website. At the top of the website, there's a link that you can click on which takes you to the YouTube channel. Um, there's more content up there than there used to be, but you'll note that the winter lecture series, uh, there we have week three, week two, week one. If you click at the top where it says videos, um, that'll take you to the complete list of videos as well as some from previous years. And if you're interested in those, uh, first we'll put up the lecture and then we'll follow with the Q&A in the interest of having the lecture available for people to watch. And then if you're interested in the Q&A, those will also be posted later on. Any questions? Thank you. Just to remind you, next week, our last week, uh, Professor William Aviles who is chair of political science at the University of Nebraska at Kearney. We'll talk about Venezuela's Bolivarian Revolution and the persistence of authoritarianism. It is Beth Ann Brooks who will introduce our speaker for today. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Courtney Hillebrecht. Uh, Dr. Hillebrecht is going to speak to us about why states turn right the Curious Case of Brazil. She received her BA in History and Spanish from Middlebury College, and then her MA and PhD in Political Science from University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's been here in Lincoln at UNL since 2010, 
Currently, she's an associate professor of political science. Since 2018, she's had the distinguished pleasure of being the Samuel Clark Waugh Professor of International Relations. Additionally, she's the director of the Forsyth Family Pro Program on uh, Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs. And she's also the faculty coordinator of the William H. Thompson Scholars Learning Community at UNL. Related to this topic, in 2012, she was a visiting scholar at the International Relations Institute at the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. She has a book in progress, hoping that it will be published next year, Beyond Backlash, How to Save the International Justice Regime from Its Opponents and Itself. Dr. Hillebrecht is um, widely uh, published, well-funded, and a frequent presenter on such topics as human rights, international relations, international organizations, international law, and public opinion. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Hillebrecht. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out on such a beautiful night and daylight savings no less. Uh, I appreciate it. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about Brazil and its rightward turn, um, but I want to start by putting it into a global context or at least a regional context. And to do that, I'm going to show you a whole bunch of infographics to get started. But let's look a little bit at how things have changed in Latin America over the past 10, 15 years. When I first got interested in Latin American politics professionally, right, so not as a, as a student, but as an academic, the real panic was Latin America is turning left. And my very first course that I taught by myself was Latin American politics. And everything on the syllabus was Latin America's leftward turn, right, how things have changed. So in 2007, as you can see in the map on the left, there was a real leftward swing that ran from the north all the way down to Uruguay, Argentina, and Chile in the region. The question on the table at this point was, are we seeing a resurgence of the Latin American leftists that were extinguished during the military dictatorships of the 60s, 70s, and 80s? And the answer to that is not really, right? What we ended up seeing was some liberal democratic progress in many countries, but in others, we saw authoritarian states with left leftward trappings, which is where we are to some extent today. From 2007 to 2016, the red is almost gone. And I would say that in Venezuela, Ecuador, and Bolivia, the left that we see is really not a liberal democratic government, a system of governance, but rather, again, an authoritarian regime with a leftist ideology. The emphasis, though, is on authoritarianism. Uruguay remains the staunch holdout in terms of left-leaning liberal politics. What else has changed or not changed in Latin America over the past 10, 15 years is a story of economic woes, triumphs and woes, really. So th this is a graph of the GDP percent change on a year earlier, which is essentially to say, is your country's economy doing better this year than it was last year? And if you look, Latin America is not performing very well. In fact, it's performing worse in some cases than Sub-Saharan Africa. Right? It's performing worse than China and India. And it's performing worse than other emerging economies, which means that growth across the region has, if not slowed, stalled altogether. After the 2008-2009 economic crisis, we can see this big dip. We have a really quick recovery, which was probably a blip in the radar followed by a slow decline. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. One, Latin American economies remain very dependent on commodity prices. Right? This is their, their main export good, and commodity prices since the recession have gone down, 
and never came back up, number one. Number two, many Latin American markets, including the Brazilian market, which we'll talk about, lack access to global markets. They've been priced out, essentially. Income inequality and corruption continue to be the name of the game. And you put all those pieces together and we have weak economic performance. To talk a little bit about income inequality, this is a map of the Gini coefficient. Anybody hear of the Gini coefficient before? Okay, some of you. The Gini coefficient measures the inequality of wealth within a country. Right? So I always like to say, we could have a country in which you, know, you all have $100 and I have a billion dollars. Our GDP per capita looks great, right? But you probably don't feel quite as good about our economic situation as I do. That's the Gini coefficient, okay? And as you see here, inequality in the Americas in general, and Latin America in particular, is particularly acute. Looking in at Brazil, Brazil has income inequality consistent with countries in the, the southern African region. It has far higher income inequality than growing economies in Asia or Central Europe. And that inequality continues to be a problem both economically, but also politically. Probably more important politically than economically. And moreover, when we see declining growth rates, right, it affects both the rich and the poor. So the graph on the left shows the relationship of how the income of the poor grew to the income of the rich. And in the early years leading up to that leftward turn, 2001, 2002, until the economic crisis of 2008, the poor were actually getting wealthier faster than the wealthy. But since the recession, since the economic crisis, that has flattened out, right? exacerbating income inequality and exacerbating political tension around income inequality. At the same time, access to local goods and services or required goods and services remains out of reach. So these numbers, if you can see them, show the percentage of people that cannot find decent housing, adequate housing. Look at some of these numbers. In Paraguay, it's 43%. Almost half of Paraguayans are struggling to find an adequate home. In Brazil, 33%. That's a third of the country without adequate housing. And if you don't have adequate housing, I would bet that you also don't have adequate access to healthcare, to food, to job security, to infrastructure, right? Cell phone usage, internet access, school, right? So this type of inequality is persistent and it's consistent across the region. And here's the other problem. <laughs> you all shake your head. Corruption. <laughs> Corruption is a problem in a few different ways. I'll give you a minute just to digest the numbers. So the darker the orange or red is the, the ranking of that country in the world on this corruption index that economists have derived. 175 is the most corrupt country that the economists could sort of fathom, okay? So Brazil is in the 60 to 90 range. Venezuela is getting up there, right? Paraguay, again, does particularly poorly on these metrics. But what really interests me is the numbers in the green bubbles. That is the percent of people in that country that feel or have, feel like they have been or have been the victim of corruption. So in Brazil, it's 14%. That's a large number, right? In Paraguay, 28%, which is to say one in four Paraguayans think they've been the victim of corruption. And I say think because corruption is essentially in the eye of the beholder. What, what you view as graft, someone else might just think of as doing business. But if you believe that in order to have your country work the way it's supposed to work, you have to participate in corruption, 
how much do you invest in democratic institutions or your democratically elected leaders? Especially when you can't find housing. And especially when your income inequality looks like this. These socioeconomic factors set the stage for much larger <coughs> political and sociological shifts. So the question I think that's on a lot of Latin Americans' minds and that we've seen manifest in these different elections is what has democracy done for us? Right? When we think back to the de democratization of Latin American countries in the mid to late 70s into the, the early 90s, democracy was going to bring a whole lot of promises. Rights, economic opportunity, growth, right, stability. And for the most part, it's done a lot of those things. But it's also failed on a lot of those accounts as well. So this is some data from the Latino Barometro, which is probably the, one of the most robust polling organizations that does public opinion work in Latin America. And if you look at this, you will see that only a quarter of Latin Americans are satisfied with democracy. Right? So three out of four would say, actually, maybe something else is better. Maybe this idea of a liberal democratic order doesn't make sense for us because we're dealing with economic decline and corruption and we're being priced out of basic goods and services. So when you have disenchantment with democracy and economic crisis and income inequality and corruption and you cannot afford school or food or water, right, you look for change. And change sometimes is not actually new at all, but old. Right? And that's essentially been the story of Latin America's rightward shift. Everything old is new again. And in that case, it's rightward leaning authoritarian, semi-democratic regimes. This for me is probably the most jarring of the infographics I'll show you, which is how many Latin Americans believe their country is progressing. Decline has surpassed progressing over the past couple years. This is a real political crisis as much as it is an economic crisis. Okay, so what do we do about it? And how can we understand how we, we got here? Let's talk about Brazil. Has anybody heard this quote before? Brazil is the country of the future and always will be. So this gets tossed around a lot, credited to a whole variety of people, Charles, Charles, de, Gaulle, Charles de Gaulle, many others. And Brazilians themselves will say this. Right? The last time I was doing some work in Brazil, uh, the taxi was late coming and, and my colleague was like, oh, that's it, Brazil's the country of the future and always will be, can't even get a taxi to come. And so it, it sort of has become this zeitgeist of, of Brazilian um, you know, thinking about their country and its, its stand in the world. So I want to take this claim that Brazil is the country of the future and always will be and interrogate it a little bit with all of you tonight. Think about the past 20 years, what's changed, what hasn't, right, and how we can use this phrase to make sense of the Bolsonaro regime and Brazil in 2020. Anyone know who these two, two people are? Yeah, who are they? Yeah, <laughs> these are the past two Brazilian presidents. <laughs> when they were young, this is Dilma on the left and Lula on the right. They were both prisoners during the dictatorship. They were both prisoners during the dictatorship. I mean, Lula, and we'll get back to Lula in a minute, he was a shoeshine boy with no higher education, working in the leftist party, same as Dilma, the workers' party, the PT. Right? And when they finally came to power in the early 2000s, it really was in a lot of ways a reckoning for the military regime. They were not you know, proponents of a neoliberal economic world order, by which I mean sort of free trade, in, in integration into international institutions, they were really part of the resistance to the authoritarianism that promoted that sort of economic and political thinking for a long time. 
So I'll tell you a little bit about their story and how they get, how they get to power. This is Lula. Everyone knows him as Lula, right? loves him as Lula. To say that Lula is adored in Brazil is an understatement. Right? Even his political opponents are charmed by Lula. Right? He was president from 2003 to 2010. In 2002, I was a very young intern working at the US Embassy in Montevideo, so the neighbor, neighboring country. And every single piece of paper that came into the office was catastrophizing about Lula. This guy's gonna be elected. What's gonna happen to Brazil? Brazil is gonna tank. No one's gonna trade with Brazil. It's gonna fall to pieces. It's gonna be a Marxist haven in Latin America. What are we gonna do about Brazil? All summer long before Lula was elected. Panic about Lula. Turns out Lula is actually a fairly moderate guy, right? And he wanted Brazil to behave economically like a lot of other countries. So the fear was somewhat unfounded. But Lula's background was as a real leftist, right? This is, this is Lula. Okay. And then this becomes Lula. And I'll show you a slide of Lula today behind bars. So, <laughs> so, so Lula comes to power. And he wins handily in this election. And he wins really handily in his first election in 2003. And the panic turns out to be mostly for, for not. He creates a cabinet and a vision for Brazil that basically says, look, we are the most populous country in Latin America. We are the most powerful country in Latin America. We have resources here, both in terms of natural resources as well as human capital. We are going to exert them on the global stage. We are going to play by global rules, but with our own twist. Brazil is not going to be the country of the future. Brazil is going to be the country of today. And Brazil made a lot of really important steps toward that reality. Trade, trade, trade was the name of the game for the Lula regime. Trading with the US, right? Uh, John Deere, of all companies, does a really robust trade with Brazil, because Braz one of Brazil's main exports is soy, which gets sold to China. Right? So you have a nice little trade triangle going on in Brazil. This is one of my favorite cabinet ministers. If you can have a favorite cabinet minister, it's this guy. Um, this is Roberto Unger, and he was known as the Minister of Ideas, which sounds like a great title to me, right? You get Minister of Ideas. And he always said he was like a bureaucrat in a world of charmers. He was not a politician. He's a Harvard Law professor. He's a technocrat. But I think he undersells himself because he's actually a dreamer. And what Unger was able to articulate that the Lula administration tried to put into policy was this idea that there's a role for Brazilian democracy to be a leader on the regional and global stage, to open up opportunities, to shrink income inequality, and to have a neoliberal economic order that involves everyone. Well, that's grandiose big statements, right? <laughs> Doesn't always work, but that was the vision. Okay. That optimism, I like this economist cover. Coco Vado is just taking off, right? It brings a lot of optimism. But I think it's also important to remember that the early 2000s were a time of heady optimism for everyone not just Brazil, right? So it's easy to think of Brazil as this outlier, but in fact, it was a sense that pervaded the, the region. One of the main goals of the first Lula administration in particular was to target lower middle class Brazilians. And they did that through a policy called Bolsa Família, which means the family pocketbook. And every family that fell into the sort of lower middle class strata got a certain monthly payment from the government with no strings attached, right? If you wanted to invest it in your kid's education, great. If you wanted to buy a TV, great. If you wanted to gamble it, fine, right? There's no strings, you just got this money. Bolsa works, although, spoiler alert, it works until it doesn't. Why? Corruption, and also it's expensive, right? It's expensive. But in the first administration, at least, Bolsa really does a lot to lift some of these families out of poverty. Lula increases the role of Brazil on this global stage 
create support for democratic institutions, though maybe in the Q&A we can talk about how real or not that is, builds infrastructure, and in doing so, sometimes crosses the very same leftists that he originally worked with. The Belle and Monte Dam, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little bit, is a major infrastructure pro project in the Northeast that was meant to create the superhighway in Brazil. But to do so, you had to tear down some of the rainforest and displace the indigenous communities there. Right? It's hard to be both a hero of the left and a capitalist at the same time, Lula finds out. Okay. Okay. After Lula comes his co-conspirator, Dilma Rousseff. Now Dilma on paper has all the right credentials. Right? She was imprisoned by the military regime, which is in fact the right credential if you're going to run for office and be a PP party member, a workers party elected official, that's sort of a criteria. Um, she's handpicked by Lula. She is the first female president of Brazil. The problem is that she lacked Lula's charm. Right? And that sounds so superficial, but she never had the same following that Lula did. And even though her policies were in fact quite consistent with Lula's, what she was unable to do was to create the same sort of party loyalty, the same degree of others going to bat for her and maybe hiding some of her mistakes that Lula was able to garner. Now, why? We can talk about that, but she never quite got that loyal following that Lula had. Now, she had some successes. This is from her own campaign material, so take that as you may. She had some successes. But notice, if you can see the dates, her campaign successes are also Lula's successes. So she's looking at the period from 2002 to 2013. Remember, Lula was president until 2010. Right? So even in the campaign material, we start to see some of the challenges. But it's true, there was economic growth, increased public spending, right? increased social equity. All these things happened while the PT was in, par in power. It's just that most of it happened under Lula and not under Rousseff. Now, what's, what we don't see and that I alluded to before during both Lula and Dilma's time is that there were real cracks right, under this facade of order and progress, that being the Brazilian slogan. There are real cracks. And I'm going to give you the example of the Belém Monte Dam. So as I said before, this Belém Monte Dam is a major construction project in the Northeast. And it's considered to be the linchpin to bring economic development into the northeast of the country, open up the Amazon. That part of the country is the poorest part of the country, right? has the least amount of trade, the least amount of infrastructure, and it also has some of the highest rates of indigenous groups. And so the Bella Monte Dam becomes a real touchstone for the goals of the party, of the PT and its founding, and the realities of governing a country. The indigenous groups that live on the land where this dam was going to be built take a case to the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. It's an international body that hears human rights disputes. And the international court tells first the Lula administration and then the Dilma administration, you have to stop this project. You will be displacing hundreds, if not thousands, of people. You will be ruining their livelihoods. You cannot do this. To which Brazil says, thank you very much. We're going to do it anyways. Right? And not only that, but they say, we're going to do it. And I think we might actually take ourselves out of this nice court that you've set up because we're not so interested in other cases like this. Right? And they, never, they never fully go through with that threat. But what that threat, I think, symbolizes is this tension or this fracture between the ideals of the party, between the ideals of Brazil being this new country, this, the future is now, 
and the realities of governing a place like Brazil in a 20th century global economy. Right? And they have to confront that, and they don't. Right? To the most extent, they don't. Okay. So if we fast forward a couple years to 2016, not even, right, what we see taking place in Brazil is really a perfect storm for a major rightward shift. And I'm talking major rightward shift. We have corruption, and I'm going to talk about a really large $5.3 billion corruption scandal. Yeah, a lot of zeros. Crime, democratic disillusionment, and then economic stagnation. Right? This is the recipe for a major change. Right? Add on top of that a leader who's not nearly as char charismatic as her predecessor, some rifts within the ideological basis of the party, and we end up with what becomes a major crisis in Brazil. Okay, the first issue that Brazil faces on a macro scale is corruption. So you saw those corruption numbers before. Right? Every Brazilian knows and every Brazilian will lament the reality of corruption in the country. And two mega sporting events, the World Cup and then the Olympics, put a spotlight on this, right? Favelas being cleared out to build stadiums on no-bid contracts, right? No-bid contracts everywhere that you can look to these major development projects. Right? And Brazilians know it's happening, it's no secret. So they mobilize in mass against corruption, both on a grand scale and then on a small scale. Corruption becomes a sign of the fact that while major indicators have improved in Brazil, that government spending that Dilma likes to talk about, so social inequality, that the fact remains that to get business done in Brazil, you have to engage in corruption. Okay. That's a political crisis, again, not an economic one, or rather it's both. In addition to that, we have economic stagnation. So this is the GDP under Brazilian presidents. Lula is this lime green. Things look pretty good. Things kind of fall apart with Dilma, who is the dark blue at the very end. Right. Brazil follows a very clear pattern of growth, essentially from the point of democratization. It's a little bit early, 1980 is a little bit early. I would put 84, 85 as the point of democratization. But you have a pretty consistent upward swing until Dilma takes office. And all those policies that seem great on the surface, the Bolsa Familia, that require not just money, but also party discipline and really careful bookkeeping, they don't have that, those things don't happen. And so GDP starts to fall. The mega sporting events, not only do they spy, shine a spotlight on corruption, but they're bad investments. They are bad for countries' economies. And Brazil is no different. Right? So you put all those pieces together, and now we have economic disaster and nothing left over for a rainy day. In addition to the corruption and the economic decline, we see a real resurgence in violence. So anecdotally, in the big cities in Brazil, in Rio or Sao Paulo, people will talk about their experience with violence and it's very normalized. Right? When I started going to Brazil in, oh gosh, 2002, 2003, it wasn't anything major to get you know, pickpocketed. It was sort of par for the course. Things then got better and then they got much worse. And not just the rates of violence, and you've seen they've gone down a little bit in the last couple of years, but the perceptions of violence. I was there last, maybe in 2016, 2017, and there was a lot of talk about quick nappings. Has anyone heard this term before? Basically, you get picked up in the street, brought to an ATM, you have to put in your code, give them all you can, and then you're let go. Now, how much that happens and how much people think it happens are probably two different numbers, but it's the how much you think it happens that matters more. Right? Because if you don't feel safe, right, 
you can't trust your neighbor, but moreover, you can't trust your government. Right? There's stories, particularly in the big cities, after clearing out favelas or neighborhoods to make way for these big sporting events. Favelas that I will say, just finally, prior to the World Cup first, just finally became fully under state control, now become sites of major violence. Now, when I say favelas that finally came under state control, I'll, talk, I'll explain that a little bit. These are major neighborhoods in the big cities, Rio and Sao Paulo in particular. And these neighborhoods for a long time after democratization were ruled mostly by gangs. Gangs got to determine who came in and who went out. And they took their fair share of corruption as well, of graft. In the early 2000s, mid 2000s, the federal police and the city police organizations started to rethink how they were going to deal with the favelas and did a lot of community substations. The substations did in fact lower the rates of violence, but they themselves were often quite violent. They killed a lot of people too, probably unnecessarily. But because bringing in these mega sporting events required sweeping the favelas, which in Rio, for example, you have your wealthiest neighborhood, a street, and one of your poorest neighborhoods. So the poorest neighborhoods got swept, by which I mean displaced, and then after the sporting events came back, but without the police substations and without the, the oversight. So we have lots of violent crime returning right, to these big cities in particular, both real and perceived. Okay, this is probably one of the most salient symbols of all of these forces together. This is an executive, an executivo, hopping into his helicopter to fly over Sao Paulo. Okay, why would he not just drive? Dangerous? Too much traffic, right? And because he can, right? So, Sao Paulo and Rio, remember these are cities of 16, 17, 20 million people are choked with traffic. Right? Sao Paulo, it can take you quite honestly two hours to get from one side of the city to another. And because they didn't have the Olympics, they have basically no public transportation and not a whole lot of safe public transportation. So you have to go by car. Cars are given alternate license plates. So you might have a license plate that can drive on the street Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I might have Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, okay? If I'm wealthy, I have two cars with two different license plates. That's how you get around it, right? Unless you're very wealthy and you take the rooftops that have been abandoned and turn them into helipads. So if you're driving around Sao Paulo, I have to drive when I'm in Sao Paulo, I don't get to fly in a helicopter. There's helicopters all over so that these ejecutivos, these executives can make their meetings and, and go safely and quickly around the city. And this is symbolic of some ways of the city's growth, right? It's a major financial hub. The city is doing well. It's an expensive place to be. But it's the disparity right, that really gets to people. It's not just that Sao Paulo is growing. It's that it's growing for some of us, which means two, three hours on bus to get where we need to go, but that this guy gets to hop in his helicopter and travel safely and comfortably and quickly. Right. So the rate of billionaires in Sao Paulo in particular skyrockets while the rest of the city is sitting in dangerous traffic. Okay. Okay. So this brings us back full circle to corruption. And you might have heard of the Lava Jato crisis which means car wash, right? laundering money, car wash. Petrobras, which is the Brazilian uh, oil energy or oil company, and the current president, Jair Bolsonaro. And they all fit together, and they all are a result of this perfect storm of democratic disenchantment, economic decline, social inequality, and corruption. Okay, this is a really small timeline, which you probably can't see, but I, I know that the slides will be online. So Petrobras, these are two, can you make out who's in those two balloons? 
It's our, it's our friends Dilma <laughs> and Lula who have previously been, been in prison, now wearing new prison jumpsuits. Updated <laughs> for the modern era. Um, so, so Petrobras is a $5.3 billion corruption scandal that involves pretty much every higher up in the workers' party, Lula and Dilma's party, as well as other parties and other politicians with which they had alliances. It involves major construction companies, one named Odebrecht, for example, and it involves the changing of, of hand, money changing hands from political elite to political elite to political elite, all of which is covered up until Michelle Temer, who is the vice president, the second time that Dilma was elected, decide and his, his allies decide that they would like to get rid of Dilma and do things a little differently. I'll note that, that Tamer was also, corrupt, also indicted on corruption charges. Okay. So this is a major scandal. 5.3 billion US dollars in an economy that's done that. Right? It's context that matters as well. It's not just the money. It's $5.3 billion in an economy that is tanked. So the Lava Jato scandal brings together, or brings down, Dilma, Tamer, her vice president, Lula, and countless other politicians. Now, Dilma and Lula say, well, actually, it's not about corruption. They're trying to get rid of us. Right? And Dilma gets impeached. Right? She gets impeached starting in December 2015 into 2016. Massive protests are saying impeachment now. That's what that banner says, impeachment now. Okay. But Dilma and Lula, as dirty as their hands might be, are not alone. The technical grounds for, for Dilma's impeachment was mismanagement of federal funds, which is probably an understatement if you embezzle billions of state dollars. Um, but they say, look, this is really just a smokescreen because 60% of the members of Congress in Brazil have also been indicted on corruption charges. 60%. Imagine how you would feel as a voter if more of your elected representatives have been indicted on corruption charges than not, right? How would that make you feel about the state of democracy in your country? Not great, not great, right? And let's say your GDP were down nearly 4%. It's not a good spot to be in, which paves the way for what may or may not have been a coup. And that decision depends on where you stand politically, right? The first sign says impeachment without a crime is a coup. And the bottom sign says out with Dilma. Brazilians are really divided by this. I have so many colleagues that I work with who had essentially breakups with family members and friends because of how they fell on this impeachment crisis. Right. Political divisiveness is not unique to the United States. Right. Brazilians are wildly divided on this topic. And while we maybe can trace some demographic or socioeconomic factors, that's who supports whom, the reality is, is that it divides people fairly evenly right? and somewhat uniquely. And that makes it really difficult to understand as a social scientist. So is it a coup? Is it not a coup? Is it a constitutional coup? Which is a term that we as political scientists have made up. It's not a thing, right? What is it? Well, to some degree, for Dilma and for Brazilians, it doesn't really matter. Dilma's out and there's a new election. And this election, 2018, there is a lot at stake. Right? There is a lot at stake. There's the recession, growing crime rates, and that omnipresent problem of corruption. There's the first presidential ouster, right? Since, or, sorry, the first presidential election since Rousseff's ouster. And Rousseff's ouster is really the first ouster, the first coup, quasi-coup, in a generation. And for a democracy that's only a generation old, right, bef before the dictatorship, or since the dictatorship, rather, that's a big problem. 
And it's a big election. You have a president, two-thirds of governors, thousands of local level seats. This isn't just a one office situation, right? This is going to change the democratic makeup of the entire country. Okay, so who's gonna run? Well, there are 13 candidates that, that are going to run for office. And who's gonna run for the PT, for the Workers' Party? Lula. No politician is more popular than Lula. I've got this under control. I'm gonna run for office, right? The problem <laughs> is that Lula is in jail. Now, originally, it doesn't stop him, right? Originally, like, minor detail, I'm gonna run for office anyways, I'm gonna put it on appeal, run for office, and probably win, right? But the courts decide that Lula, who was indicted and found guilty of corruption in this Lava Jato case, said he could not run for office while he was in jail. And in what is actually, even though it doesn't seem like it, a victory for Brazilian democracy, he doesn't. Right? We could imagine a very different world in which that ruling is not accepted. Right? So okay, we'll abide by the court, Lula won't run. So they turn the party over to sort of a mid-level politician without any charisma, as far as anyone can tell. And he loses handily to a guy named Jair Bolsonaro. And Lula, Lula's tweeting, obviously, right? And he's tweeting, I beg you with all my heart to vote for my stand-in. But it's not enough. Right, it's not enough. No tweet is going to do this job. So we get this guy, who is Jair Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro ran on a very aggressive, uh, right-leaning uh, campaign. He basically said, no more corruption, no more crime. Right? Out with the PT once and for all. And this is the, the Workers' Party. He wanted more authoritarian tendencies, bring the military back in. He was a military guy himself. And had really offensive, terrible things to say about women, the LGBTQA community, and particularly indigenous communities, endorsing their killing. And, and the climate, and the climate. Bolsonaro inspires Women across the country, today is International Women's Day, right? Um, to, to create a major nationwide campaign to say out with Bolsonaro, but the campaign falls short. Bolsonaro wins 55% of the vote. The anti-corruption, anti-crime, pro-growth, right? That, those three, three items are what lead him really to, to victory. Bolsonaro and, in general, the 2018 election is largely won and run on WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is an app, as you might imagine, owned by no other than Facebook, in which you send messages to your friends. It's essentially free app-based texting. Right. And WhatsApp becomes a source of viral misinformation. Not surprising us, right? Viral misinformation. But what's different about WhatsApp than, say, Facebook or Twitter <coughs> is that it's private in your groups. So there's no public fact-checking happening, right? We talk in the U.S. a lot about our siloed sources of information. You know, I get what I get, you get what you get. Well, WhatsApp exacerbates that because it's not on anybody's wall. It's all in private groups. So bots, essentially, hacker bots, would feed misinformation to private groups, and that would then circulate across that text chain, but without ever seeing the public light of day, so there was no fact-checking. And so this WhatsApp election was really rife with misinformation, rife with misinformation. Um, and that sign says he lies on WhatsApp. <laughs> okay. So how is Bolsonaro doing? Well, he's doing okay based on his campaign promises. Um, as promised, he's pushed the industrialization of the Amazon. Now, the left 
And even the center in Brazil has really pushed back against this, but this was a campaign promise, right? Move and displace indigenous communities, tear down the trees and commercialize the land. That was a campaign promise. And he's actually shown quite good on that. A tax on minorities and, uh, and putting a blind eye to tax on indigenous groups, that was very much true. His education minister had to resign recently for, for quoting Goebbels um, and, and suggesting that be integrated into the curriculum. There is a decreasing homicide rate, right? Particularly in those big cities, that's been a huge part of his campaign. And there's been modest economic growth. Approval ratings are actually quite good, right? His approval ratings are actually quite good. But at the same time, Bolsonaro's democracy, a version of democracy has come at some real costs. And this is why I say everything old is new again. And the main thing that Bolsonaro has accomplished is gutting democratic institutions. Right? So the privatization of security is a big one. What that means is that instead of the police or uh, the military, we have private armed actors doing security jobs. So crime is down because private military actors are up. Right. Whether or not that's sustainable in the long term, sort of anyone's question, right. but typically as political scientists, we think of the privatization of security as a real risk down the road. The burning of the rainforest and regular trolling of political opposition have set up two crises, both environmental and political, um, that Brazil will likely have to reckon with in the next few years. This is a former president's tweet. This is Fernando Henrique Cardoso, who was a president a long time ago. And this tweet is about one of uh, Bolsonaro's initiatives, which was to essentially shut down and shrink Congress. Which you'll know, Congress is a critical ingredient to democracy in Brazil. Right? And so Bolsonaro was encouraging everyone to go out and protest Congress as an institution and shut it down for a little bit, which is really alarming. It's really alarming that we could take one of the main pillars of democracy and just try to shut it down with a protest organized on Twitter. But that's what he's, he's doing. Enrique Cardoso says, to be silent is to agree. You need to use your voices. You need to speak out. The protest stopped. The protest never happened, actually but the threat was there. So what happens? This is not a Brazilian flag, it's a Chilean flag. Right? And I, I use this picture for a reason. Brazil is in many ways different from, but also the leader of Latin America. Right? Brazilians will tell you we are very di different from Latin America, we are Latin American, but we are Brazilian first, right? We have our own language, we have the biggest economy, the biggest territory, we are our own thing, don't confuse us. But at the same time, they're a leader in the region and they set trends. So when we see these protests happening in Chile over corruption, income inequality and lack of access and poor GDP performance, it sounds pretty familiar. Right? In fact, it sounds very familiar. So what happens in Brazil really sets the tone, I would say, for what happens in the rest of the region. It also affects the globe. When we think about the natural resources and the human capital that Brazil has, right, what happens there will affect the globe. Right? And that's something that we can't avoid, but also something that we don't have much say in. So I will end. This is my daughter on our last trip to Brazil. And if you can tell that little guy back there is a capybara, it's the world's largest rodent, the size of a labradoodle. <laughs> So I know we have a break, and then I'll take your questions at the end, or after that. Thank you.